Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition, our first for 2024. Our topic tonight is Pharmacology Potpourri, Topical to Orals in Primary Care Optometry. And our speaker is Dr. Chris Putnam. He is Doctor of Optometry from Pacific University. He was commissioned in 2004 as part of the Health Profession Scholarship Program, computed, completed the United States Air Force Optometry Residence Program at Williford Hall Medical Center, and has won a board certification. He is competitively selected to attend Air Force Institute of Technology to pursue, pursue a PhD in vision science. He is selected to help align the activities of all U.S. Air Force optometrists across 75 clinics of the Air Force Medical Spe Services Strategic Vision. He currently he is Medical Education Training Campus Department Chair for Diagnostic and Public Health Services, overseeing nine programs across radiology, labor laboratory, public health, behavioral health, and technician training. Well, I'm sure we can all appreciate his service to our country as well as her, his service to our profession in delivering great education. So with that, Chris, please take over. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joe and Greg, uh, Vanessa, for everything you've done. So, yes, good evening, everyone. So tonight we're going to be talking about a uh, pharmacologic potpourri, if you will. And we're really going to focus primarily on some of the off-label opportunities out there. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can utilize in your arsenal many of the medications, both topically and orally, what we use every day in a more potentially meaningful uh, fashion for some of our patients. Just the obligatory financial disclosure slide. So all of this content was prepared by me, no outside in undue influence. Um, so we just took a polling question, but I wanted to start this one off right away if possible. So in your daily practice, do you currently utilize off-label medication mm -hmm. use? And I think this is going to kind of kind of set the tone and really, I think, underscore the way we look at and maybe even define for ourselves what off-label medication really uses. So, Chris, as you go through, um, we'll use probably polling question two or three to get caught up on questions and answers for you. Nothing obviously has rolled in yet. Um, so, and I'll launch probably the hand, your hand out here shortly. So, I'll keep all right, on. we've got, we've got a great response already. So let's just share the answer. Here you go. Excellent. So honestly, when I have given this in the past, this is a very uh, consistent breakdown of the, the audience. And even within colleagues at the university incarnate word, where I also practice and then the VA here in town. So with um, that in mind, what I think I'd like to do is from an off-label standpoint, uh, I think there's a lot of um, overlap in the idea coming out of Stanford and Boston University that you really can't dream of a face you've never seen. So a lot of times when we have an inspired idea, when we have an absolutely groundbreaking epiphany, if you will, a lot of that is purely because we have melded together or instituted the wisdom of crowns and utilize what we already knew and utilize it in a unique and novel manner. So I think that's going to underscore a lot of what we're going to talk about. And so from an off-label medication standpoint, we'll talk about the Food and Drug Administration and some of the processes, the timelines, and the barriers to entry that will always keep some of the medications that we use daily off-label purely based on time and cost constraints. So we won't spend a lot of time with the uh, FDA process, but you can see that really the FDA's mission as defined is the use and marketing of regulated medical products. And it's really the marketing that becomes the critical piece of this definition. So you can see that the FDA label has those five specific factors. And you can see in the timeline on the bottom right, the clinical trials can take a significant length of time. So for all of the costs and research and requirements that a drug company must go through, not all of those products are winners. Not all of those products even make it to market. And so a lot of times what you'll see is there will be a lot of basic science, kind of phenomenology, if you will, 
that will build on what the next generation medication is. But if you understand the pharmacodynamics, some of the pharmacokinetics and the class of medications, I think you'll see in this presentation and especially in the handout, what we have in our existing arsenal across the US and uh, different across states, but uh, what we have within our pharmaceutical armamentarium is actually quite impressive. I like to put uh, this up because you'll see the crux of just about all of my presentations. I'm an evidence-based practice guy. So I am a true believer in peer-reviewed, randomized controlled trials, meta-analyses, uh, systematic reviews. And you can see this one that came out in the um, Journal of the American Medical Association Internal Med. Off-label medication use lacking strong scientific evidence had a higher adverse drug event rate compared to on-label use. So it's not necessarily saying that you shouldn't use off-label medications. They just need to be backed up by the peer-reviewed journals, and they have to have provider understanding and knowledge of what you're using that medication for. Some of the barriers to the FDA process of why can't we just make some of these fantastic drug classes more available and make them FDA approved? And it has a lot to do with the cost and the resource concerns that every drug company would have to get in. So if there's already an existing medication that's used widely, widely right now, there's really not a market share for some of the large pharmaceuticals to take the time and the effort and most importantly, the cost undertakings to pursue that. But what we're going to go through is I will give you at the very end a rundown of all of these medications and how they're utilized. And as a provider myself, I have gone through hours and hours of uh, CE over my 18 years as a clinical optometrist. So the number one question that we should all be asking ourselves is what does this mean to me? And hopefully at the end, I will answer that fully and completely. And I can always stay online to answer questions. But what we're going to show here is what a few that you might not recognize that are off-label are actually off-label and they're the standard of care that we use on an almost daily basis. And from an on-label, off-label, I won't spend a lot of time here, but there's just a, a few of the therapeutic medications and that red bar right in the center, that's the FDA approval date. And so if you look at the red dots, which are off-label indications, you can see that prior to and after FDA approval, there are still significant non-FDA and FDA trials that continue on these medications. Because I think sometimes, especially um, early on in my clinical uh, training, I thought of the FDA approval process as a very static, very finite process. You got FDA approval, that's the drug, that's what you're gonna use as the standard of care or the gold standard for the remainder of your days. But there is a significant amount of dynamism in the FDA approval process. So just going quickly through these as well, the proper use of off-label medications, the number one thing to take home on these slides is the use of an approved product is not restricted by the FDA to label limitations, meaning that the FDA recognizes that the clinician, the provider has that clinical discretion to utilize in the best interest of the patient that drug class. So you can see that the example on the bottom for all of us that co-manage patients in a clinical setting Intravitreal antibiotic use for post-operative uh, endophthalmitis, there is no FDA-approved drug for that, but it's virtually standard of care, and it's utilized widely in surgical centers across the country. So when you think of off-label medication use as we go through these slides, really your choice to use a medication to treat a condition that it's not FDA-approved for is really risk management. It's a cost-benefit analysis to determine is this best for the patient? Does it provide or create potential for harm? And am I doing the right thing clinically? So investigational use, if anyone has ever worked on an investigational study, um, that's what the top portion is for. So off-label medication use can be covered under an investigational use um, pathway, but there's also an informed consent. And as we mentioned earlier, FDA approval status does not define appropriate medical practice nor regulate your medical practice. The decision must fall within the standard of care, but medical practice is the relationship between patient and provider. So always keeping that in mind, because it is off label, that does not mean it is off limits. And then most importantly, especially to all the providers out here, um, we'll move into the medications in a moment, but insurance carrier criteria. 
So use of an off-label medication to treat a condition and have insurance coverage of that requires two things. It's medically necessary. So it's an FDA drug that's medically necessary for that condition. And it has to be recognized essentially in one of those drug compendiums or supported by clinical research in a peer-reviewed scientific literature. And that's exactly what I will provide to you. Um, during my graduate training at UMSO, uh, my instructor was very keen on the adage, uh, the plural of anecdote is not data. So everything that I will give you today is supported by case series, randomized controls, meta-analyses. So everything that I will show is published in the peer-reviewed literature and given to you as a reference this evening. Rules of engagement. So I know there's four uh, brethren out there. So the ROEs for tonight, we are only going to talk about evidence-based medicine. So if there is a medication that is utilized in an off-label manner, if it cannot be found in the peer-reviewed literature, I'm not going to be covering it tonight. The slides are information dense, so I won't read them verbatim because uh, no one enjoys that anyway, but I'll make sure that we hit only the high points, but these are your slides to keep and really, it's a starting point for reference. And we'll talk about the Cochrane database at the end. And for those that are unacqu unacquainted with a Cochrane database, it's a fantastic way to read meta-analyses that are really just given to you that show strength of evidence and clinical value and relevance. And also importantly, the pharmacology discussed, it's synergistic and adjunctive. So I am none of these medication uh, applications for off-label use are meant to be a replacement for standard of care. They're meant to be synergistic or adjunctive, but not a replacement. And then the summary slides, the pearls at the very end, those are all for you and they will summarize everything in four slides. So can't uh, talk about off-label medications without talking about the godfather of off-label medications. You can see that I put in quotation at the very bottom. This is from one of the, the prominent ophthalmologists that uh, performs retinal procedures and has for over 25 years. Uh, I did not get permission to use it or his name, so I just quoted it. But management of exudative conditions is really has been used without definitive data from clinical trials. So this is one where the ophthalmology profession recognized the value of Avastin, which is really just a larger molecule of FDA-approved Lucentis, but it's been utilized for many years. And so I pulled this up specifically because it is about 20 years old, but you can see in a head-to-head -head comparison between essentially the FDA-approved anti-VEGF and then Avastin that it's very similar at its one-month best corrected VA and its mean central foveal thickness decrease. What I did want to show is in the green box on the figure on the top, that is actually, I think, also very important to know because when you look at what your clinical outcomes are or your expected clinical outcomes when you're giving patient education, we know what the clinical data is, but it becomes very important, and it was actually summarized just this year, that what we see in the clinical data is not necessarily real world. And I say this not because the anti-VEGF space uh, needs necessarily more medications or it's failing at its job, but what we see in a tightly controlled clinical trial is not necessarily representative of what a real world clinical practice is. There's difficulty with patient follow-ups. You might not be on that perfect eight to 12 week schedule. There could be comorbidities. There could be changes in health status. So if you look at that figure on the right, you can see for BRVO and DME, the real world analysis falls below what some of those sentinel kind of um, major, uh, major trials predicted. So you will see that although this is what the trial will predict, real world analysis shows that there is significant trade space for some of these off-label medications to be clinically useful. And you can also see on the left side, that it's not just about the medication itself, it's about the real world logistics of having a patient who's gonna spend nearly three hours during this treatment. And in many cases needs transport to and from the appointment by a caregiver. So just real world logistics get in the way. And so finding a synergistic adjunctive off-label medication might be exactly what we as primary care optometry can offer. Hey, Chris, are you going to chat about the now launch poll? That's a good time there. Um, I did put the handout in there. Are you going to talk about Bayview and what happened with it and once it came to market? 
Um, I wasn't going to get too far into that one. Um, I was going to keep it into different drug classes, but at the yeah. very end, if there's time allowed, I'd be more than happy. No, I, what I want to do, I didn't want to step on your toes. I want to make a comment now as this polling question is kind of feed off of your last, your last comment and your last slide was a classic example was Bayview that was out there. I think it was Novartis that had this medication. It was for macular degeneration, and it was supposed to be able to inject and maybe get three months out of it. So they went through all the trials, like Chris said, you know, went through all phase one, two, three, all the different phases that are out there. It comes to market. They start injecting it in a larger population of people. And all of a sudden, you started getting these intraocular inflammations and artery and vein occlusions and all this stuff that happened. So that just was, I didn't want to, if you were going to talk about that, I didn't want to step on your toes, but that kind of highlights what you just said there. We were all hyped up about Bayview. Where did it go? When we yep. started using it in the masses, they found out that, that a person could have an antibody for that anti-VEGF and they would get this reaction to it. So then you'd have to test to see if they had the antibody. Well, that's cool. Well, then they could develop an antibody later. She so had to keep testing for the antibody if you wanted to use it. So um, that just kind of shows you a little bit of what you just said there. Yeah, and that's perfect. Because as you're pulling up a polling question, Greg, that's exactly right. Because in clinical trials, they are and fantastic. Um, I think uh, in clinical trials, it's so strictly controlled when they select their subjects, right? So if you want to trust, trust or test the efficacy and you want to ensure that you're doing the right thing, the subjects are specifically selected and more importantly, subjects are specifically excluded that are not necessarily representative of a real world trial. So when you look at real world results, it's not as you can't expect nearly the level of resolution and vision recovery in a real world environment that you could in a clinical trial. So Moving on, um, so we'll start off very, very easily with some of the easier anti-infectives, and then we'll get into some of the little bit more complex pharmacodynamics. But fourth generation fluoroquinolones, this is the part where I, I think that most of my uh, clinician friends, I graduated from Pacific University in 2005 and completed my residency in, in 2009. So who hasn't used a fourth generation fluoroquinolone for a corneal condition? corneal ulceration with a suspected bacterial etiology, bacterial keratitis, you absolutely in, have probably used a fourth generation fluoroquinolone, but its FDA approval is for bacterial conjunctivitis. And so this has been going on even since I wasn't in school. And so this is just representative to kind of start the conversation that many of the medications that we use as almost standard of care may in fact be off label or being used outside their original FDA approval um, process. So you can see that fourth generation fluoroquinolones appear to have a little bit better coverage and less bacterial resistance, and especially for some of the gram positive bacterium. So Zirgan, um, this is another one, it's FDA approval is for herpetic keratitis. So it's a, a great drug. It's far better than the uh, Viroptic of old. I remember seven to nine drops. The patient thought the treatment was worse than the actual herpetic eye infection. But with gancyclovir, it opens up some trade space. But most importantly in there is the off-label use in the literature is adenoviral conjunctival infections. So you can see that the anti-adenoviral effects of gancyclovir are actually quite, quite impressive. And so under the results, I put that in there because the, the cytotoxicity is always a concern. And that's really back to the Viroptic discussion is you can see that the 50% cytotoxicity is actually incredibly high because gancyclovir, just like acyclovir, it's specific for herpetic DNA. So you need to use exorbitantly high amounts, amounts that would never be treating a patient to actually pose a potential health risk has significant inhibitory uh, effects against a number of the adenoviral serotypes. However, Zirgan without insurance coverage, not an inexpensive drug. So where does this leave us for a potential EKC or PCF? Um, for my, uh, again, four brethren in the uh, military, if they ever spent time at a basic training or an academy. So we had the uh, USAFA with Jack's Valley and uh, I spent some time here at the basic military training site. Uh, Betadine was our friend. This protocol has been out there for a very long time. 
I think everyone is very familiar. You want to anesthetize the eye using a follow-up, either topical NSAID or topical corticosteroid also improves patient uh, satisfaction and compliance. But I think the most important thing that comes out of the literature for this one was even with a 2%, so a less concentrated uh, betadine or povidone iodine, you can see that the recovery was essentially 79% within a week. Now, EKC, you could argue, typically is self-resolving, but that self-resolution can take two up to three weeks, and you can also cause some corneal changes, SEI development and potential uh, opacifications. And so a lot of times to resolve this very, very quickly, think back to Bob Costas in the 2014 Sochi Olympics, right? So Bob Costas needed an optometrist that knew what betadine was because we could have wrapped this thing up a lot, lot quicker for him. But interestingly, out of the literature, you can see that even if the causative organism is not fully known, it's still povidone iodine because it is used for pre-surgical prep or perioperative prep. It's not scorched earth necessarily, but it's very effective against both viral and bacterial causative agents. So topical azithromycin or azocyte. This is the one where I think I'll insert my first cautionary. Hey Chris, Chris before you move on real quick, do you do provodone like washes and treatments for EKC and viral conjunctivitis? Um, only if it looks like it's a cluster case, meaning at uh, basic military training here, if there's a particular dorm or barrack that looks like it's being widespread and it uh, looks like I'm having three or four individuals out of the same flight, I will do that, but it's it's typically not a standard practice, but I will use it in those cases where I think they're close quarters. It's going to spread like wildfire and I want to get ahead of it. So can you can you just walk us through a patient comes in, you know, your 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 barrack people come in, you set them in the chair, you're dropping a few drops in of five percent is, you know, what number, like what percent? And then how long do you let it sit there? And then do you rinse and then put us like, you know, for our clinicians out there that might want to, you know, to try this, um, how do you do it in the practice? Uh, so yeah, usually I will, you, the perioperative prep is typically 10% betadine, but you can get the ophthalmic prep and I'll scroll back to that here. You can get the ophthalmic prep that is the 5% betadine. Uh, typically what I'll do is I'll use a topical preparacane. I'll anesthetize the eye. Um, I will soak the eye for better lack of a term three four drops and i've let it sit for about 15 to 20 seconds maybe 30 seconds and then i will rinse it thoroughly um, not necessarily a morgan lens but i will use a balanced sterile salt solution and i will rinse and irrigate that eye the best i possibly can and then i rinse it a little more and then following up i will usually put them on a topical NSAID and follow them back in three days or they don't have to return if they're not having any continued problems. Yeah. The only thing I'll add to it is as you put those drops in there, if you just want to take a sterile gauze and just kind of smear it across those eyelashes or around that orbital area, almost as if you're prepping them for, for, uh, for uh, surgery, kind of get all those little buggers in there and, you know, and, and kill them all. So I just kind of, I do the same thing you do in the office, except I just kind of smear it around to hit the eyebrows, eyelashes, get the skin there. So. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, because essentially if there is some uh, residual uh, viral particles floating around that are not living on the conge, but on the lid margin, on the lash follicles, they're soon to just fall into that same area. So that's that's a very good point. A very good point. Perfect. Thank you. So moving down. Well, before, you, before you go on, there is a question that just came in. Yes. Does this reduce the incidence of pseudomembranes? It does. Um, so essentially with that chronic inflammatory state, that's usually where the pseudomembranes will develop. So if you think you have a patient at risk or a patient with a history of pseudomembranes um, development, I, I like to use it, especially in those cases that it's either been recalcitrant or they've had it going on for a while, or it's not resolving the way they think it should. So yes is my answer to that. And I will usually select my patient population accordingly. And the other thing that I do a little bit different than Chris does is I'll probably go to like a load of Prednol or steroid rather than an NSAID because this does kill everything. You're going to get a nice inflammatory reaction, but that would then help with that pseudomembrane too. No, very good point. Um, so moving on to the azocytes, you can see also bacterial conjunctivitis was its FDA approval, but I think most of us um, 
have also found efficacy in posterior blepharitis and meibomian gland dysfunction. So I think that this is also something to keep in mind. Um, we'll talk about oral doxycycline coming down the pike in a moment, but oral azithromycin is also head-to-head -head equivalency, very uh, similar to some of the doxycycline um, efficacy studies from meibomian gland dysfunction is related to um, KCS or dry eye. Um, it has shown clinical benefit and research benefit that it's significantly, uh, st statistically significant in comparison to warm compresses alone. However, much like Zirgan, you're also going to see that azocyte is not necessarily an inexpensive medication yeah. without that medication or that pharmaceutical coverage. Here's the cautionary tale that I referenced a little bit. This is where the FDA does get involved because FDA does have concern that if a medication is being marketed to the providers outside of its FDA approval lane, that's where concerns can come. And so um, this one resulted a number of years ago. I think a lot of it comes from the Center of Medicaid Services, the VA, when representatives in the um, in that realm, it wasn't Merck because Merck bought this company uh, later, so I won't cast aspersions, but that's the marketing that's important. So when a representative or a drug company does tell you about the value of their medication for a particular condition, it must be marketed as the FDA approval allows. So it can't necessarily talk about these off-label effects or the secondary um, benefits. It must stick strictly to the FDA approval. So anti-inflammatories, um, some, I think, really good space in here, especially for all of my uh, clinicians that see patients on a daily basis. Before we get too deep into the meds themselves, from a corneal penetration paradigm, um, I think this is something just to keep in mind as you see patients clinically. When you see the generic name end in acetate versus alcohol versus phosphate, they have differences in corneal penetration. So your acetates will tend to have the most corneal penetration, alcohols will have the second most, and phosphates will have the least amount of corneal penetration. I think this can become important because at the university, we also have a community care uh, referral pipeline. So a lot of times the selection of your medication is absolutely driven by the finances, driven by the economic just realities that I can't put them on. And I, Greg, I love lodopredinol. Don't get me wrong. I love the ester-based steroids, but some of my patients just don't fit into a category where I can get that. So if you're con wanting corneal penetration or you want that particle steroid effect on the surface, consider what type of medication that you're choosing. So are you going to talk about how the, uh, since you're talking mechanism of action, you're going to talk a little bit and the, and the, you said Esther, you're going to cover that. And when you get to those parts. Um, so I won't go necessarily into like the arachidonic acid down to the leukotriene COX-1, COX-2. Um, I only think of dividing them into the soft versus hard steroids. So ketone based steroids are the, the Flarex, FML, Fred Forte versus an ester-based steroid, which tends to be the Allrex or Lodamax. Yeah. So the, the, the comment that I'll make, and if it comes up, we can cover it again. But, you know, um, I don't like calling them hard and soft for the fact that then people don't think that they work as hard. But I do get the reference, understanding the pharmacology side of it. Remember that the esters um, get broken down by, remember the eye, Chris, Chris said ketones. We really don't have any ketone enzymes on the eye, so it has to get broken down by the liver. But the eye has plenty of plasma colonesterase. And when the eye is hot, that's why, you know, your steroids, you know, don't really penetrate to the retina or the Lodomax that he's talking about. Just remember that the eye has a lot of plasma colonesterase. So it breaks it down. You don't get that super deep penetration like you do with the ketones or all the other medications like you just talked about, the prednisolone acetate. The way you can think about that is all of your topical proparacanes are esters. So when you have a hot eye, whether it's propericane, tetraclane, uh, whatever's in, fluoresce, it's uh, binoxinate. Those are all esters. You have a hot eye, you don't get a deep anesthesia. So if I have a hot eye and I can't get a deep anesthesia, I'm trying to take a foreign body, I'll, I'll use some lidocaine because now that's an amide and it doesn't get broken down. So just kind of using pharmacology here as our advantage, kind of taking Chris talked about cortical steroids, ketones penetrating. We can fold that into your 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 esters for your topical anesthetics and for your steroids. So just keeping it no, kind of clinical. 
No, that's fantastic. No, that's an excellent segue. So from the uh, pernicillin acetate or PF 1%, Pred Forte 1%, FDA approval is for inflammation of the papebral and bulbar um, conge, cornea, and interior seg. But I think a lot of us, especially if you're managing a aqueous deficiency or a um, meibomian gland dysfunction, a lot of our keratoconjunctivitis sicca patients will benefit from having the reduced inflammation on the surface of the eye. And I think the important thing to consider here is it's not just about the inflammatory cascade. There's a lot of neurotrophic growth factors, nerve growth factors. And in fact, some of the benefit that you can get by treating dry eye with a corticosteroid is it lowers the nerve growth factor expression. So you're actually reducing not only the inflammation, but also some of those earlier pathways that can lead to continued dry eye symptoms. And so I think that's the important part is you're, you're taking care of some of the interleukins, some of the cytokines, in addition to uh, the inflammatory cascade that tends to be present in virtually all of your um, virtually all of your dry eye patients. So Durazol, um, this one I I like a lot, and I'll show you the study and why I like it a lot. You can see that it's post surgical inflammation. So I know a number of us out there have used um, diflopredinate and will use that in non-surgical patients because of its very long half-life and its very effective time on station. But I think the most important part of why I like um, Durazol has to do with the iritis and uveitis associated with systemic conditions. So if I have a patient that tends to have um, an anterior uveitis, a iritis, even, a, um, even an intermediate uveitis, for an endogenous-based anterior chamber reaction that they have an underlying collagen vascular disease, they have an underlying autoimmune condition, diflopredinate tends to work much more effectively than your prednisolone acetate. And so you can see in these studies here that the diflopredinate clears the cells a little bit quicker. There's less withdrawals from the prescribed duration of the use. And the uh, essentially the lack of efficacy is much, much less. So there's greater efficacy in the diflopredinate, especially for those that have an endogenous uveitis. So there's an underlying systemic condition leading to that uveitis. So I think from a clinical standpoint, keeping Durazol kind of in the back of your mind is always a good idea. You know, Chris, I, I've had a lot of success using Durazol with anterior scleritis as well. I mean, it'll, it'll work on things that Pred Forte will not touch. Are you going to discuss the pressure elevation with the, with the diflopredinate at all? Um, I, I, I can right now. So yes, yeah, so diflopredinate, because it does have a longer half-life, because its dosing is only BID, if you have a steroid responder, which approximately 33% of the population is, you can get a longer prolonged IOP response. And much like when you would have a steroid response, what's the number one way to treat it? Discontinue the steroid. But because diflopredinate stays on target much longer, you may have to consider that if you're having that steroid response, you need to mitigate it with a pressure lowering drop um, as quick as possible. You now, Chris, a lot, a lot of our colleagues tend to shy away from it because of the pressure elevation. It doesn't happen any more often than prednisolone acetate, but when it happens, it usually happens quicker, within a week or two, and the pressure elevation can be dramatically higher. Now, there was a paper that came out several years ago, and, and it was in the optometric literature doing a, an analysis of published cases back when Durazol was relatively new, and... Uh, Embarrassingly, one of my you know one of my cases was published. They they looked at it and they found that the ones that really got into trouble with pressure elevations were when the clinician was using it like Fred Forte. Absolutely. Not 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 leaving it at, at a QID basis, but like every two hours, every right. hour, and that's where we we get into the trouble. So if you're using diflopredinate, I think it's a great drug, and it, it, it's great now that it's generic and, and I think relatively affordable. QID, even though the inflammation may look bad, QID, don't go over it. That will help mitigate some of the pressure responses. Absolutely. Nope. That's perfect. Thank you. Very good. Um, 
so we'll move out of the corticosteroids and into some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So you can see that the FDA approval here, pain and inflammation associated with surgery. But as we even mentioned the betadine trial earlier, I think there's a lot, there's a broad action space for what we can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for. And some of the off-label uses, I'll show right in here that a steroid NSAID combo, the penetration isn't fantastic. It's not a magic bullet, but there is significant uh, a body of growing evidence that using a kind of combo, and I'll show you that combo in a moment, to treat some of the diabetic macular edema, to treat some of the cystoid macular edema. And this is where it goes back to one of my very first slides. There may be a need for that anti-VEGF. There may be a need to get them referred to a, a retinal specialist, but in that referral time period, there's going to be a two, four, sometimes six week lag to give them a synergistic or adjunctive option in that meantime to potentially reduce some of that central foveal thickness, to reduce some of that edema and um, cystoid um, inflammatory change. Absolutely value added. And I wish I would have had the follow up pictures, but this was a, a patient of mine that presented right around Thanksgiving. So you can uh, see that there's some, uh, you know, retinal atrophy in there and very clear bone spicules, so pathognomonic. But I think the interesting thing is these are community care patients. So when this patient presented to me at the university, they were just referred for an eye exam. And effectively, there was no baseline to consider. So in the right eye, you can see they presented with a best corrected 2150 and they presented with a best corrected 2080. And I don't have the follow-up photos, but using the Predforte, Ketorolac, Dorzolamide, that synergistic effect at week four, it was half of that. By week eight, almost all of the CME that you see demonstrated on that was, was resolved. And so from an RP standpoint, approximately 20% of RP patients will present with concurrent CME. So I think a lot of times when we have either a cone rod or a, um, you know, a potential macular dystrophy, it's important to also make sure that there's not an underlying inflammatory condition resulting in some CME that could potentially be mitigated to improve that visual function of the patient. So topical, topical cyclosporine, so restasis and sequa, um, you can see that it's for keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, uh, sicca, and for dry eye syndrome. You can see some of the off-label uh, identified conditions in the literature. I think the one that I found most intriguing, and so this is for everyone's reference, but herpetic stromal keratitis, because this becomes that challenging part where how quickly do I want to put them on a corticosteroid, especially if I believe there's stromal changes, but I need to balance, do I have the herpetic infection under control? I think this, because it's a calcineurin inhibitor, so it's a little bit different pathway, I think that this opens up some trade space for primary care optometry, that if you're not quite comfortable moving straight into a topical corticosteroid, utilization of a topical cyclosporine to minimize the stromal scarring following herpes simplex um, keratitis, I, I think there might be some value here. And you can see that the conclusions from this study in 2019, essentially the cyclosporine, it is 2%, so you'll need to, um, to ensure that you're using a compounding pharmacist. But I think there's value in looking at using cyclosporine because its calcineurin inhibition is different than that um, arachidonic pathway that we talked about earlier. But this is a nice advent to protect that cornea and prevent some of that potential scarring. Um, mucolytics and antiglaucomas, and some of these are fresh off the presses from actually just 2023 leading into 24. So uh, mucomist, I think this is one that it's no longer available commercially here in the U.S., but I think that you can um, use a compounding pharmacist. There is a compounding pharmacist that we uh, use through the university, and I think the most important part is filamentary keratitis. I think most of us are very familiar with that, but especially here in San Antonio, Texas, it's that pterygium. So if you have a patient that tends to have either a faster progressing uh, pterygia change or has had pterygia removal surgery and looks like a recurrence is imminent, there's a, uh, a study that came out that showed that these groups that were divided into treatment with topical N-acetylcysteine versus, um, excuse me, oral versus topical and a control group. And you can see in the topical application of mucomist or N-acetylcysteine, there is significant improvement in that pterygia um, inhibition. 
So using topical NAC reduces inflammation, reduces the hyperplasia and the development recurrence of pterygia. So not a panacea, not gonna work for everyone, but an off-label indication that you can keep in your back pocket to potentially offer that patient some way to not watch that pterygia uh, increase. Of course, we would talk artificial tears, UV reduction, sunglasses, and so forth. But here's one more tool in your tool set to potentially offer to that patient. Apriclonidine, um, post-surgical IOP control. I think um, any of us have uh, worked in a co-management or in a surgical uh, center, you'll see a lot of this. But I think the important one is cocaine, also tough to come by. So certainly this is used in the, uh, the neurologic realm. I think uh, Dr. Selko is better equipped to uh, discuss all of this. But certainly we know about its value as a differential diagnostic agent in Horner syndrome, but I think it's the ptosis, especially in post-botulism ptosis, because a number of the patients that we have at the university utilize Botox injections to treat their migraines. But with that Botox injection, that also comes with a little bit of induced ptosis. So in this study, they had looked at the upper eyelid response you know, to topical 0.5% apiclonidine. And you can see that there is a significant impact, 91% of the patients, 91% of those total eyelids, excuse me, had a positive increase. Now, paradoxically, there was a small percentage, so 4% of those subjects had a decrease, and 11% had a increase on one side and a decrease on the other. So this is not, again, meant to solve the long-term issue. But I think there is some value for those patients that I have a, um, a cosmetic reason for considering either a ptosis sling or a blepharoplasty, but something that you can offer for a patient that has senior pictures, wedding photos, anniversary pictures, something might be coming up. It's a, it's a way to offer them a very non-invasive cosmetic mm -hmm. improvement to uh, equalize that eyelid symmetry. So bromonidine, uh, again, another IOP reduction. I think virtually everyone on this call has used uh, bromonidine or alpha-GAN at some point in their career. Um, I think one of the most interesting parts or one of the things that I will use this off-label the most in is my young, healthy patients with giant pupils. Because I think a lot of us, you'll have a patient that you've done virtually, it's the best prescription you've ever given. You've entered uh, you've offered anti-reflective coating. You, you've given just about everything you possibly can. But what happens is if that patient has a large pupil, not only are you getting a lot of those higher order aberrations introduced by that large aperture, it becomes very difficult to minimize any uh, light coming in because in a mesopic low light environment, um, you want as much light as possible. But for these young, healthy patients with giant pupils, they're always going to have some level of glare from oncoming traffic, a little bit of difficulty with night halo and starburst. But this one came out of um, Will, Walter Reed, actually. And so what they found is by using, after one hour of using uh, bromonidine, essentially it shrunk the pupil size just enough. You can see that it went from about six millimeters down to about 4.5 millimeters but just that small decrease while still allowing pupillary function gave them a, a cut out those higher order aberrations that made a subjective improvement in how that patient functioned at night. Again, not a magic bullet to solve everything, but certainly an option to give for some of your patients that have and struggle with night glare, night halos, and you've exhausted every other weapon, every other tool in your toolbox. Uh, so dorzolamide, I think I gave a sneak peek uh, earlier for the treatment of uh, DME and uh, CME, but you can see, and you know, it's a it's a glaucoma medication. It's an ant, it's a ocular hypertension medication, but its important part is dorzolamide is much like what you would think of when you uh, treat high altitude cerebral edema or high altitude pulmonary edema. So this is effectively like a topical diamox. And because it is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, it's literally pulling the fluid out of the retina. Now, it's not perfect in all the ways. And I know that I'm essentially walking back some of these. It's not perfect in every situation, but it's an option that your peers may not know about, but something that you can give to your patient, something that you can offer to your patient that they are reticent to have an intravitreal injection. They're very concerned because they have um, economic 
issues. They can't get to the clinic. There's, there's logistical issues that they can't take the time to get to the clinic, but something that you can offer from a chronic central serous chorioretinopathy that you could mitigate some of that central foveal thickness. And you can see that the BCVA was similar at three months, but you do get a more rapid reduction in your central macular thickness by the addition of uh, topical gorzolamide. Hey, Chris, I'm going to yeah. um, ask a couple of questions here that have rolled in, um, give you a little break there. Um, we're back to the uh, provodone uh, iodine, provodone iodine. Um, that said, uh, what if the patient is allergic? Is there any, I, I don't know of any other alternative if the patient is allergic. Um, do mm -hmm. you have any other? I, I do not. To be at that point, um, if, if it was my patient and uh, povidone iodine is not an option, I would either look at dilution is the solution and just flush, flush, flush as much as I could and give copious artificial tears and then some um, palliative type of care or that Zergan is still an option, but prescription coverage is probably a requirement to go down the Zergan. But unfortunately, I don't know a good workaround if there is, if there's an allergy to the beta time. And then you're speaking on the pupil. Joe, do you have any, did you have a comment there or are you good? No, I, I, it's really going to be just symptomatic care, which is what we had before we started using povidone iodine. We just used steroids, steroids and tears and cold. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I probably would have used steroids too, uh, but you know, you're not killing the virus, but it, that's going now to the to the uh, treatment of the symptoms. So, the and, other question that rolled of... in, the other question that rolled in was, uh, does Lumify also work for pupil glare reduction? It does, and so we're actually that is going to be one of my future slides. Evidently, somebody has read ahead of my slides, but yes, because Lumify is a lower concentration of bromonidine, so. Um, it doesn't have as a much effect on the pupil because of the lower concentration, but it certainly does have that effect on the um, on the vasculature and the superficial conjunctiva. So yes, we will absolutely get to that here in just a few minutes, but great Perfect. question. Um, so from Timolol 0.5%, this is something that I've started using over the last five or six years. Um, this one, I think, because it's another glaucoma medication, it's an antihypertensive, um, mm -hmm. but from a migraine management Propranolol, Inderol, is an oral beta blocker that is used on a prophylactic uh, migraine treatment paradigm. But this was a, a essentially a study that came out in 2018. It started into the NIH trials. I don't know um, where they're at on the phase three on that. But the interesting part about this is by using the beta blocker, specifically timolol topically, you're bypassing systemic metabolism. So you're allowing the beta blocker to act on the target organ more quickly and more readily. And so the uh, 26 migraine patients here, you can see that 40% found them very effective while only 4% using the placebo found it effective. So um, I think there's some value here for those uh, recalcitrant or intractable migraine sufferers where they've exhausted virtually every other option. Triptans aren't fantastic. They've had a lot of, you know, a lot of difficulty finding relief. I think this is something from a primary care optometry standpoint that you can absolutely offer in your clinical care. Um, the vital component is if it's going to work, it's going to work very quickly. And it's one drop in each eye. You wait 15 minutes and then one drop in each eye. And that's it. If it's going to work, it's really going to work within about 15 to 20 minutes after that second set of drop goes. I'm just curious if anyone is a migraine sufferer out there has used it and tried it. And if it's worked, please put it in the, in the chat, in the chat box. Yes, please do. And I know I'm violating my, uh, plural of anecdote is data. But I would say of the dozen, maybe 14 or so, I think I'm about 65 to 70 percent successful. Um, certainly, you can't discount placebo effect either. But if the placebo effect is giving some valuable improvement to that patient's symptoms, I still think that that's a, a valuable trade space for primary care optometry. And you can see even in that last study, there is... A difference between the treatment group and the placebo group. So that beta blocker is adding just that much more oomph that can get that patient into a, a better control over their migraines. Um, this one, just real briefly, uh, timolol and dorzolamide. Um, this one is for elevated IOP and primary open angle or op uh, ocular hypertension. But I think the interesting ones that came out in the study here was they had looked at a, uh, a 2020 study 
and they were looking at 50 neovascular AMD patients. And so with this set of 50 subjects, they left the anti-VEGF intravitreals at the same um, interval schedule. So they continued the same way. And essentially they were assigned 27 to the dorzolamide timolol topical, and they kept three to the placebo. And you can see that the dorzolamide timolol versus placebo, um, not a significant improvement in best corrected VA, but you can see that it essentially decreased their central foveal thickness. It, their maximum PED was also decreased. And I think you get some anatomic resolution, if you will. I think there's some value here that if you are in a co-management position or you have a patient that does have regular anti-VEGF or regular, uh, regular intravitreal injections, there is value to consider adding this topical, ensuring that they're a good patient selection too. So no cardiac concerns, no respiratory concerns. But I think this is that synergistic adjunctive um, way forward that we talked about initially that you're not going to fix everything, but you're going to give some meaningful improvement to these patients without an invasive procedure. Joe, the question that rolled in here, I think it's going to be more down your specialty is um, Chris was talking about Timolol using it for migraines. The question that rolled in is are new neurologists aware of the effect of Timolol, the topical Timolol? I'll let Joe take a crack at it first because he's more the neuro guy and Chris you can certainly take a crack at it so the answer is no they 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 really aren't I I've not had any patients uh with migraine true migraine uh okay. migraine headache get put on topical timbal by a neurologist you know they there are things out there that neurologists know but they don't do you know the whole idea behind OCT for neurodegenerative diseases. I talked to some neuro neurologists in my in my area, and their response was, "Yeah, I heard about that. Should I be doing that?" So they they don't they don't follow. I've never seen a, a patient on topical timolol from from this. Now, question can come in that would be, well, what about patients who have auras of migraine? Will topical timolol help? And the answer is, I would tell you, absolutely. Tell a patient if you prescribe it. Put it in as soon as you see, start to see the aura. Within about twenty minutes, it'll 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 go away. You yeah, have to tell I, them it'll go away in twenty minutes. Otherwise, yeah, and absolutely, that's been my experience as well. So a lot of times, um, if I do see a patient that's ever used topical timolol, it doesn't come from neurology; it will come from ophthalmology, or it will come mm -hmm. from another optometrist. But in, in I found this to be kind of a a, a nice little wild card because this is something the patient has not heard of and was not offered in the past. And this can be a real game changer from a optometric management and just a, a business management standpoint that you can offer mm -hmm. something under your care that may have never been offered to them in the past. So I, I really like it from that aspect. So, but yes, no, uh, moving on. So reduction, uh, you can see that uh, a uh, real kinase inhibitor, so Repressa, um, reduction of elevated IOP, um, much like the anti-glaucoma drugs we've been talking about. Um, but I think the important thing here is that real kinase inhibitor has actually a growing amount of uh, case series and case studies where the first one I read was about three or four years ago. This one came out just a couple of years back. But what they're seeing is, is individuals that have... Um, potential Fuchs dystrophy, if they have endothelial cell dysfunction, if there is some type of endo, corneal endothelial dysfunction, the rho kinase inhibition actually can help corneal clearance. It actually helps clear some of that edema without having to do the uh, the more invasive corneal surgical procedures. I think that the, uh, the ROC inhibitor, I think, is an alternative to potentially some of those mild to moderate to help keep them out of the surgeon's chair and potentially prolong uh, the duration before they need that corneal um, that corneal presentation or that corneal uh, surgical condition. So I think there's a lot of value in considering this. This one, I don't have as much experience with. I think I have tried this on two patients. I don't think I've seen them back yet. I did this before the holidays. Um, but I, I would be very interested to anyone on the call that has seen success with this. In the literature, there's five or six case reports and case series that come up on this. So I think this is a very intriguing thing, especially from a primary care standpoint. Chris, well, so you in, talk. In, in, ahead, our, in, our, in our practice, where we do some DREC, 
which is just stripping of the uh, the endothelial cells for Fuchs and letting it grow in. The tarsidil is part of the postoperative uh, care. Perfect. Well, that's, that's actually very really you talked about this, uh, you know, a few times you've had it, you've lectured. That's why we picked you to kind of do this lecture again, you know, on a webinar. I think our audience would you know, would appreciate hearing some of this. Since I've heard you talk about that, um, I've used it. I've had success. But the think the cool thing about this med or what we want to talk to the audience about is all the different kind of side effects that this medication can have. Right. So it can create that whirl pattern in the that pigmentation. So the Tarsidil product. You know, whether it's, you know, uh, Ropressa or, um, you know, what is it when it's uh, in with the Rock, uh, Rocklatan. Rocklatan, thank you. Rocklatan and Ropressa, um, it can be, uh, it, create the, it create the corneal whorl. In an eye that's kind of dead and blind, it creates a kind of honeycomb. So not a live eye that I've ever seen it reported, but kind of a, a deadish eye that you might be taking kind of cornea edema out. Um, but it can create a honeycomb type of to the epithelium. So it's kind of neat all the different kind of corneal effects this have, some positive, some negative. Um, but yeah, I've seen it pull out some edema. Yes. Yeah. And so I think this is just a nice option, especially from a primary care standpoint. So this can help maybe uh, bridge that gap between referral for the DLAC or DSEC, but this can allow you to maintain that patient uh, corneal clearance and corneal clarity for a little bit longer time. So polling question number three, um, want to lob someone, lob it up there. This is one of our very first slides. And, the reason and you're that all I... caught up on, uh, you're all caught up on your questions. So I think what I'll do is just launch the handout one more time. The handout was in the email 15 to 20 minutes before the post event survey. We'll have the, uh, We'll have the email um, or we'll have the handout. So, all right. Cool. I know that I have a question for, for to come in talking about uh, the antibiotics uh, going back earlier, Chris. You know, we, uh, we, and we still do, and the coronal specialists are still using fortified antibiotics like the vancomycin and tobermycin for their infectious keratitis. And interestingly, there's no clinical studies that ever show that they're more efficacious. It was just back then you had chloramphenicol, sulfacetamide, uh, maybe gentamicin, tobermycin. So they were actually anointed the standard of care. And there's no studies that actually showed anything worked better. It's just the philosophy more must be better. Right. So there's no standard of care issue there. They're, they've just anointed the standard. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that fits neatly into the off-label medication is because what we have treated as conventional wisdom after a while becomes a standard of care, even in the absence of the peer-reviewed literature, even in the absence of FDA approval. Um, so what we'll do here is I have about 45 minutes remaining, so I'll uh, delve a little bit more into the oral medication. So there's no shortage of uh, off-label medication uh, usages for oral medications in the ophthalmic literature. But you'll see the ones that I put in uh, yellow with an asterisk. Those are the ones that I use on a more regular basis. Um, I'll put a few of these in, and they'll also show up in your take-home cheat sheet at the very end. But we'll go over a few more of these in depth, always centered on the evidence-based medicine. So, oral doxycycline. Um, I like the FDA approvals here because it's a tetracycline class. Um, just point of interest, if anyone is treating plague, cholera, syphilis, or malaria, malaria, I can understand being military, this is uh, this is your deployment package, but plague, cholera, I, fantastic that we have uh, medications out there for that, but I can't remember the last time I've seen a case of plague or cholera, but it is FDA approved, so if you've got doxy in the house, you are uh, well equipped, but I think some of the more interesting things from the oral doxy doxycycline is the neovascular AMD. And so this is a, a study, it's a smaller study with consecutive patients, so not a randomized control, but the same anti-inflammatory properties that doxycycline shows when we use it for, say, myeloma and gland dysfunction, or when we use it for a, um, a lid, lid-based inflammation or infection. It Co-treatment with doxycycline, along with their intravitreal um, anti-VEGF, 
had essentially less letter reduction, fewer injections, and decreased foveal thickness. So just something to consider, and there'll be a few more oral medications coming up here in a moment that this is not necessarily your standard of care or the standard of care, but something adjunctive, something to also consider that if this patient is a uh, is a good fit for a potential oral doxycycline, there might be value in giving them just a little bit more response to those anti-VEGF injections. Atorvastatin, um, this is usually for my atrophic AMD lecture because there is evidence that uh, higher dosages of atorvastatin, right around 80 milligrams, does reduce uh, drusen load and does reduce um, high-risk atrophic what? AMD. But I think the interesting part on the atorvastatin is that lipid mitigation also can reduce the progression of diabetic retinopathy. So this particular um, study came out in 2018, and they essentially did a meta-analysis. So these are some of my favorites. So I like the fact that the meta-analyses, they will look at like-built studies, and by using similar methodologies, similar patient selections on these meta-analyses, you can increase your end value, and you can get a significant, uh, significantly greater effect size and show... Uh, statistical relevance as you kind of pool these uh, randomized controls together. So from this one, they showed that lipid lowering drugs were associated with reduced risk in diabetic retinopathy predict, um, progression with an odds ratio of essentially 0 0.77. That's actually pretty significant. That's um, That means that there is actually a 23% lessening that you are going to progress in your diabetic retinopathy if you're utilizing one of these lipid lowering agents. Um, I think that's something where it's imperative as primary care optometry that we're always involved in the patient's systemic care. So it's vital to do the review of systems. It's vital to do the uh, medication cross-check and to ensure that you're taking care of the whole patient, knowing that that, uh, that eye is the window to the soul. There is neurologic, there's cardiovascular, there's a number of different systemic conditions that are going to present in the eye and sometimes first so um, I think having a, a good handle on the fact that using a statin or a lipid lowering agent can reduce the risk of diabetic retinopathy progression, I think that can be a real critical tool when uh, assessing the whole patient. Um, oral metformin, another one for neovascular AMD. So I think everyone's familiar with metformin. Um, this one is outside the scope of this talk, but metformin um, is in a number of like longevity studies right now. They're NIH sponsored studies that uh, utilizing metformin can essentially uh, almost give you a uh, a boost in ensuring that the insulin and the excuse me the glucose is being used properly and so I think that it's interesting that metformin which has been around for a very long time and is very inexpensive is getting a renewed interest especially in the uh, anti aging community and the uh, the longevity community but for our purposes you can see that oral metformin in relationship to uh, neovascular AMD, that they looked at a huge case control study. So you can see that they used 86,000 to 87,000 subjects and matched that same number and looked at the diabetic cases and the diabetic controls. And they found that metformin use essentially was a reduced odds ratio of developing neovascular AMD um, without inpatients without DR. So it reduced it in both cohorts, but it's even more effective to use metformin, which is a diabetic drug in a patient that doesn't have diabetes. And that sounds a little counterintuitive, but I'll say that again. The metformin showed its greatest effects in the cohort that didn't have diabetes, but utilized the metformin to minimize the neovascular AMD development. So this is, uh, I think, really important for primary care optometry to recognize that so many of these systemic conditions and so many of these medications have synergistic effects. That big three of blood pressure, blood sugar, and your total cholesterol, those three are synergistic and they do play off of one another. So it's not enough to have one good or two good. You really want to keep a close eye on all three because that's where you will get the most systemic improvement, the greatest benefit from not only a retinal health, but a visual performance standpoint. And you can see that that protective effect was noted for 24 month cumulative doses, 
below 1080. So usually it's a it's a two it's a BID 500 mg dosing for um for metformin. So this is a very common dosing within the uh, the community. Orlacinopril. This is where I was also going to mention that with the diabetic progression, lisinopril can decrease uh, retinopathy progression in non-hypertensive patients. So much like using metformin in a non-diabetic, this would be the use of using lisinopril in a non-hypertensive. So it's controlling all three of those things because they are negatively synergistic, if I can use that phrase, they feed off of one another. So if you have someone with an uncontrolled high blood pressure and uncontrolled blood sugar, they will make virtually everything else worse. So you can have uh, inflammatory cascades, you get a high level of uh, systemic, essentially inflammation that almost feeds like a snake feeding on its tail, where you will get significant changes in worsening of their overall health as well as their retinal findings. Um, topical ivermectin, um, now that Tarsus is on the market, um, I, I think that this one is maybe not as widely utilized, but I know that this was something that even at previous uh, conferences that I had attended, topical ivermectin, um, I still think within the um, DHA, the Defense Health Agency, you have to do a trial failure before I consider um, the uh, the Tarsus medication. So topical ivermectin, it's FDA approved for bacterial, uh, in essentially excuse me, parasitic infections. So you can see that the topical ivermectin, because it's an anti-parasitic, Demodex is a parasite. So this is looking at the efficacy of topical ivermectin in the treatment of uh, Demodex. And you can see that this came out just in 2020. And so um, this is a nice option that if that patient, if there's that patient doesn't have a, a good prescription coverage that would allow the usage of uh, the Tarsus medication, uh, you could consider utilizing topical ivermectin because it does show some improvement in Demodex lid infections. And you can see that test group um, essentially over a, uh, a once a week improved significantly in both eyelid redness, swelling, and telentasia. So I think that for your populations, especially with that aging population and any patient that does live in a assisted living care or a community living, Demodex is in the high 90s. It's a significant prevalence rate when you're living in an assisted living or a, um, a community living. So if you see patients coming from the nursing home, if you see patients in their 75, 80, 85 years of age, this is a, a very real option to utilize to minimize some of those Demodex lid infections. Chris, you have down there that it's topical uh, ivermectin 1%. Um, is that ophthalmic or is that a non-ophthalmic? This one, as I believe it, this was the non-ophthalmic in the study. This is the I mean, is there an ophthalmic? I mean, I understand that Tarsus has theirs, but is, is topical ivermectin 1% come in a topical form? Um, I'm sorry, it's topical, but not, not ophthalmic. It comes in a topical form, but not an, not that I'm aware of. So it's a, it's a okay. topical um, antiparasitic. Is, is so we, we you know, we'd have to find the topical ivermectin one percent, and then I see you used it here. You, there, there are studies here using it ophthalmically. Yes, and that's exactly what this study was. So you actually okay. apply the uh, the topical on the lashes and on the base of the lash itself. Yeah, we just have to be, I guess, maybe careful of just maybe not getting it into the eye. Okay, good. I've heard I've hear people talking about it, um, that you're educating me, and people always ask during lectures, and because I speak on the Tarsus product in the lectures, and then they say, so, what about ivermectin? I'm like, oral, right. topical, this will help out. So Yeah, absolutely. And so the oral does have some benefit, but it's not nearly as um, robust as the topical, because you're getting it directly on the uh, the site of action. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. So magnesium, I won't spend a ton of time on this one because um, everybody gets lid twitches. Um, talk to any student in uh, school, talk to any early provider, talk to any of us old guys. Lid twitches come everywhere all the time. And the reason I like to put this one in there is because we're always told to eat a banana or eat a high magnesium food. And so will hypomagnesia uh, cause myokinia? Turns out that it doesn't. The thing that does cause lid twitch is essentially 
sleep quality, fatigue, and caffeine consumption. So um, I think a lot of times if I have patients that will have the benign lid twitch and it's driving them crazy, I found success with cold compresses. Um, I think that just slowing down the nerve conduction a little bit because the tissue is so thin and the, uh, the, the nerve plexus and the musculature is so close to the surface, if you can cool down the nerve conduction a little bit, that typically will help resolve at least short term, a lot of the lid twitch. But the biggest thing is fatigue, sleep quality, and caffeine consumption. You, 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 can't, uh, you can't have a two-legged stool. Um, so you do need to take a look at fixing one of those underlying causes to really minimize the lid twitch. So Chris, I always say myokinus season is, you know, that time between Thanksgiving and Christmas, right? That's when all these start showing up. So isn't that just ironic? Caffeine, lack of sleep, all that. Everyone's trying to prepare for the holidays, trying to do what they need to do. Um, but yeah, because it's just that that time of season when they have low magnesium, right? It's kind of funny how it is that sleep, caffeine, and that and then throwing off that circadian rhythm. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, so selenium, again, so this is a supplement much like magnesium, so it is not directly FDA regulated. But I think if you do some literature search on selenium, I think a lot of the selenium work right now and a lot of the published articles is in the uh, cognitive domain. So um, selenium, there is some evidence out there that there could be some value um, in selenium supplementation for mild cognitive impairment, some early Alzheimer's. But I did also want to make sure that I think, not that the jury's out, but I think you need to read these with also caution because when you get into working with patients with a, um, a high or a strong family history of Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment in their family, it's, it's terrifying for them. So they are very, they're vulnerable and they will cling on to anything. And that's why I put the Suvenade on the bottom is that Cochrane database a lot of these, I think there's going to be, need to be a little bit more research and a little bit more long-term research on what the exact mechanism of action is. But certainly you can see that some of these, um, these studies uh, in the Nutrients 2022 article that is showing that selenium levels and the many, many mental state um, evaluation scores, they were improved with selenium supplementation. There is a relationship. So is it going to fix or stave off? Not necessarily. As I've mentioned several times before, it's not a magic bullet, but this can be a conversation for some of your high-risk um, Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment patients or strong family history patients. This could be something to consider ensuring that that supplementation is in their diet. And this paper itself, it's usually, I, don't, I believe it's around 50 micrograms, but it, it does differ across the papers. But this is the one where on the bottom right, I just want to make sure because sometimes you can have Patients that were they were told absolutely this is what you need to use absolutely this is what you should be doing but make sure that the evidence based medicine supports that and does back that up. You know, Chris, let me just kind of make a comment when it comes to these supplementations, magnesiums, and this and that. And I think you and Joe realized the last six or eight years I've been kind of diving into some of this nutritional stuff because we're getting to early diagnosis that, you know, lifestyle, sleep, exercise, nutrition, all kind of play in there. And this is kind of a little bit, I know you love your evidence-based medicine, you love your clinical trials, but all those things are acute, right? So when you're trying to look at these chronic diseases like Alzheimer's that are out there and we're trying to do an acute, you know, a randomized clinical trial, you know, that's why we will see selenium work. We'll see an omega-3. We'll see omega-6s. We'll see magnesium. We'll see carotenoids. We'll see resveratrol. We'll see CoQ10 because we're running them through these, you know, these randomized clinical trials, which are acute. And that's what we like. But then we don't know how to do it with evidence-based risk-adjusted medicine that's out there. So it's kind of something that I've learned over the years to be able to play in the acute phase, randomized clinical trials. I, I, I truly believe in them. We need them, but it's more for the acute stuff. And when we start trying to apply it to these chronic things, that's why you came up with your disclaimer. Be careful because it's just not selenium. It's just not magnesium. It's just not. It's learning how to play them. But we like to see randomized clinical trials. So now we got to put them into this little short, small cohort. So, 
Absolutely. No, and, and I think I think that's a very good point. Uh, I think if there are interested uh, budding researchers online, the wealth of knowledge lives over in the UK biobank because the system of medical delivery in the UK is cradle to grave. So because it falls under a, a socialized medical structure, you can have a patient literally in a single electronic medical record for the duration of their life. And I'll show you a couple studies coming up that the UK can find this stuff well before we can because we have such a disparate electronic medical record. The UK has millions, millions of historical patients that they can pull out. So um, much to Greg's point, you're right, to really to parse out, to tease out some of these very subtle long-term for chronic disease management, I think that there is a lot of value for some of these supplements. And we'll talk even more about a few of these supplements here in a moment. So, so what um, you just talked about was evidence informed risk adjusted medicine. You just showed selenium and how it works. And you're saying, be careful because people gravitate. Right. I don't think selenium is the answer but something maybe with selenium. And then what you're telling him is that it's evidence-informed risk-adjusted medicine. That's kind of what happens in kind of the naturopathic, that's kind of naturopathic talk that's out there. Okay, okay. I'm good. Yeah, no, I like that. No, thank you. Um, so yeah, moving to uh, L-lysine. This is one that I absolutely gravitate towards. So um, if you have patients that tend to have significant cold sores, repetitive keratitis issues in that line, um, the way that uh, L-lysine works is it essentially depletes arginine. And because arginine is needed in herpetic DNA synthesis, if you just deplete the arginine, the herpetic DNA cannot replicate. So um, the study on the right, bottom right, you can see that the risk ratio, if you stay under 2000 uh, milligrams a day, there's virtually no risk whatsoever. And so you a lot of times what I recommend, and I'll have all the doses at the very end, so frequency, duration, dosage for all of these is usually right at about 1,000 milligrams for a maintenance, bumping it up to 2,000 if they feel the prodromal um, herpetic outbreak. So especially for those patients that you're concerned that there is a corneal involvement, there's a risk of peri, um, periorbital involvement, I think that L-lysine certainly is a nice adjunct from a supplementation stage. Preservation. Um, I put this one there because this kind of caught me by surprise. The uh, the more I dug into some of this, that we understand that AREDS2 and its utilization for moderate to severe atrophic AMD, but essentially for the treatment of idiopathic macular telangtasia, there is value in using an AREDS2 supplement for IMT to help reduce the risk of neovascular changes. So I think there might be some just kind of keeping that in your back pocket. If you have an IMT1 or an IMT2 patient, there is clinical evidence. There is some um, evidence-based medicine that says AREDS2 is a viable therapeutic strategy to reduce their neovascular risk. Paul Bernstein is doing a whole study on this, Chris. You might want to check it out. He's hmm. just got funding for it. And I think you might know he's kind of the one of the fathers of macular pigment. I know that's where you did your PhD. And, Absolutely. Yep. Um, but he's yep. doing something uh, or he's got uh, a nice cohort and he's following it and so on and so forth. So before you jump into this, let's do some questions sure. here so we don't get too far behind. Sure. Um, any thoughts on Vuity are you using in practice? And that could be you, me, and Joe, I guess. So Absolutely. Um, and interestingly, this is someone else that has read my slides ahead of time because that will also be addressed in a moment. Um, I think that Vuity has a uh, has an absolute niche out there. I think that patient selection is critical when utilizing Vuity. I think if you're choosing patients that are advanced presbyopics, um, I, I don't think you're going to get the bang for your buck, um, at least from the literature. Yes, there is a risk of a potential RD, but I don't think it's as, as high as what has been purported. So that's where I'll stand on that. Joe, any comments on Beauty? No, I, I agree. It, 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 it is a bit of a niche product. Uh, there are some people I've had that have done very well, but <clears throat> over time, they tend not to, uh, to refill. They tend to stop refilling. Sometimes it's been beneficial in patients who were premium IOL patients who need a little bit more time and help adapting. And that seems to be one of the niches that I've used it in. But beyond that, I agree, Chris. It's a it's a niche, and uh, 
probably the risk of retinal detachment is a bit overrated. And I agree with that because we used it all kinds at the PCO back in the days before all these glaucoma medications. We had people on 6% pilo, but uh, right. the only comment I'll make is um, uh, is that there's going to be some probably some other products coming out in this category. So let's kind of keep an eye on that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. A comment was made. Some ENT specialists are using PRED off-label, less expensive uh, than the cortical steroids for uh, ear canal ex eczema looks like um hmm. so would yeah. we work through patients pcp to describe orals and other ocular conditions i wasn't i missed that one sam if you want to put that one in there and re-ask and then to get caught up it says so quinine and topical water no longer effective well i think it is i do it for my patients but i think it's more to get them rehydrated. I tell them, go, I have a grocery store right behind my office. I said, run right over to Martin's, go grab some quinines, a muscle relaxer. Um, I think all I'm doing is rehydrating them more than anything, getting out some of that caffeine. If they're overdosed on caffeine, um, making them pee a little bit, probably setting a reset in their body and then maybe they'll get some good sleep. But uh, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, I think it still works out there with the quinine with water. Yeah, I would agree. I agree the same. Um, and so I, I'll just circle before I go further, I'll circle back. Absolutely. So um, I'll show you at the very end, the, the Hippocrates and some of the drug interaction calculators. But yes, to start some of these, um, these oral pharmaceuticals, yes, your pathway is the PCM. And I think that is from an integrative medicine standpoint, I think that's the real value here is you can really start to develop that holistic patient management standpoint that if I know who their PCM is and their PCM knows who I am, I think that's really where the best care for your patient base can come from. It's not an easy path and you're going to have some, you know, PCMs that are receptive and some that aren't, but just like you're going to have some optometrists that are receptive and some aren't, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. So um, being active military, there is some benefit because I play ball with the, you know, the dermatologist, I, you know, run with the radiologist. So it, it really helps to have that, medical campus feel because it's much easier to work with someone that you have a personal relationship with but once you can establish that personal relationship i think that's there the whole where the holistic management will come into place so one more question rolled in it says is it recommended to use a consent form retinal detachments before prescribing duity um i'll make my comment joe lectures more in the kind of the uh you know, the consent form arena and some of his lectures, you know, to me, what I do in my, um, in my electronic health record for a lot of my medications is I type out RBQA, risks, benefits, questions, answers for all these different medications, whether it's Plaquenil, whether it's doxycycline, whether it's a steroid causing a cataract, I don't get, I don't put uh, a consent form to do steroids cause increased pressure or cataract. Um, uh, from prescribing doxycycline, pseudotumor cerebri, the photosensitivity um, that are out there, the pigmentation changes. I don't do a consent form, but what I do type in the in the chart is risks benefit RBQA, and then I'll and I have it kind of typed up everything I want in there, and I can click on it goes right into the chart. So in this case, I would say you know hey, it's going to shrink your pupil, it's you know it's going to dim the lights down, might put you at a slight risk of increased retinal detachment. You know, patient decided she would like their he or she would like to have this medication prescribed. I think as long as you put the, that into the chart, I don't think you have to do a consent form. But Joe, you're kind of our medical kind of speaking from your uh, lectures that you do for your Florida required uh, uh, courses. Do you do you have a comment? What you're putting is it's good to if there is a bad outcome, they're going to argue that you didn't explain it well enough and that it's not there. I'm not telling you you're you're falling short. I, I, none, I, I don't think any of us do it, Greg. You know, I don't think anybody says risk of retinal detachment with beauty. We, we, we will often hand out the samples. We sometimes don't think about it. But there's only so much we can we can reasonably do. Now, question becomes, you know, what what is standard of care? And the question we have to ask is, what would a reasonable and prudent optometrist do in a situation like that? And that's, you know, that dictates what our standard of care is. 
That's very good. So, yeah, so yeah. no consent form, type it into the chart and go from there. Does that sound reasonable? It's very, it's very reasonable. And it's usually more than I see in malpractice cases. There you go. Well, switching gears, um, we'll go back in. So chromium again falls into that supplementation realm. I think that the chromium one that I had interest in, in is again the anti-vegf therapy. So you'll have patients that will have a need for regularly scheduled intravitreal injections. And so this one came out in 2021 that with diabetic macular edema, there seems to be a benefit in the reduction of the amount of edema and essentially the lessening of the number of intravitreal injections necessary. Um, this one, I couldn't find a lot more on the um, randomized control trials, but I think there might be some value that the chromium, that's another 50 microgram supplement. Um, I think there might be value in exploring this as well for some of your patients that do have a higher risk for neovascular change um, higher risk for diabetic macular edema, that it does show that essentially you can have the average number of intravitreal injections, thereby reducing risk of the complications of the vit intravitreal injection by simply adding a, a low-dose chromium supplement. Yeah. Um, this one, I think, is also very nice. I've used this a number of times in the clinic. So beta carotene, I think everybody's very familiar with beta carotene, the AREDS2, and um, you know some of the risks for small, smell, small cell carcinoma in uh, prior smokers. But I think, interestingly, multiple recurrent chalazion. There's a number of studies out there that show not only children, but adults tend to have lower um, levels of serum beta carotene. And they would show that with a matched and age match control, that the individuals that would utilize a beta carotene, not a vitamin A, because beta carotene is the pro drug and the body knows what it's doing, so it's only wow. going to convert so much. Wow. But using a beta carotene supplement shows value in reducing the amount and the severity of some of these recurrent chalasia. So, again, another one that it's not the the perfect answer in every patient, but if you have that patient who just struggles and they're chronically chronically trying to mitigate the number of chalasia, I think vitamin A supplementation is a real option. Um, so arginine, um, this is another one. It's You can think of it as topical Botox, 10% um, arginine. Um, it, it's much like the, the, the previously reported using preparation H because of its phenylephrine to reduce uh, wrinkles and festoons. But this one, I think there's there's some value in this one because you're going to have a number of patients that are going to come in that they're on the fence about a cosmetic procedure, a Botox injection, and especially optometry's world is the face. So I think there's a lot of value in knowing that this product is out there, knowing there is a market for this, whether this is something that you choose to recommend or not recommend. I think it's important to know that this product does exist. You can find it really on Amazon. You can go to cosmetic call, um, counters virtually in any mall, Macy's in the nation, and you can find Argeline. So essentially it's a snap inhibitor. It's a topical Botox, if you want to think of it that way, but I just know. to make our, our providers and our fellow, uh, fellow optometrists aware. Why do you have the volume down? So we could watch it and not. All right. I'll keep on trucking. Adam. So we're looking Adam. at the uh, omega-3 fatty acids. So the uh, omega-3 fatty acids, I think we're all very, very aware of this one. There's enhanced macular pigment deposition for the dry eye, but I also, or for omega-3 supplementation, but I also really like the fact that here is the randomized controlled trials. Here's a large chunk of evidence that omega-3, especially high bioavailability omega-3, omega has value for treating dry eye syndrome, for, for treating dry eye disease. And so this is that one because there'll always once in a while be some vacillation out there in the literature. Like, is it valuable? Is it not valuable? I, I stand by it. I, I really think that there is a need for clinical primary care optometry to have uh, omega-3 supplementation in their arsenal. And I think this one, especially for dry eye disease, this, this is the, uh, the ground truth. Um, another one, as uh, Greg had mentioned, my PhD work was in macular pigment, so um, we did a lot of uh, spatial mapping and measurements of optical density as it related to contrast sensitivity, glare uh, reduction, um, 
across the retina. And so these are some of the supplements from a macular pigmentation or a lutein mesozeaxanthin zeaxanthin uh, supplementation. These, um, I like the, the MacuHealth product because it does have all three of the carotenoids. There's some differences of opinion in the professional literature. I, I think there is value in having a three carotenoid formulation. Um, I do think that the meta-analysis that came out of whatever macular pigment supplement, whatever lutein, mesozeaxanthin, or zeaxanthin supplement you like, if you can take at least 20 milligrams and you can use it for at least three months, that patient will start to recognize their own qualitative visual improvements. And that then leads into continued usage, which can mitigate diabetic retinopathy, AMD, and a number of other uh, retinal high oxidative uh, conditions. So I think that there is a lot of value in considering the, uh, the MACU health. I also think that the same company has vitreous health. How many of us have floaters out there? How many of us have patients that have floaters out there? And I think that this supplement from vitreous health, this is one of the, uh, the few vitreous supplementations that has some subjective and objective data to back it up. So I do use this in the clinic and it takes about three to four months, but you can, it shows that the patient and even the patients of ours that we will play with that zero delay line and defocus the OCT, but you can absolutely see some qualitative improvement in not only their reported um, floater severity, but you can also see that the floaters themselves begin to coalesce down. They actually shrink in size. And so there's a, uh, I think a nice, nice tool in the toolbox to have a supplement that's clinically shown to reduce the amount of um, patient subjective uh, difficulties to vitreous floaters. I know we have about 10 minutes left, so we'll try to pick this up. Um, mm -hmm. This one, this is a relatively newer study that came out, but I know especially with the opioid epidemic that we've gone through and are still kind of going through and the tightening of how you can use Schedule II narcotics, I think this one I, I use with all of our uh, externs and our residents. This one is quite literally using Tylenol and ibuprofen at 400 milligrams of ibuprofen and 1,000 milligrams of acetaminophen. And this was used in an urban emergency department. And you can see the scores. So the treatment using NSAIDs is nearly equivalent and in most cases better than using an opiate to control the pain because a lot of the pain is inflammation driven. Now we can talk about central versus peripheral acting um, pain inhibition, but I think this is, especially in a primary care setting, if you have this dosage down and you're looking to manage pain, I think this is a really nice off-ramp, a really easy button, if you will, for pain management in a primary care clinic. Yeah, Chris, um, that works in wonderful for... in the clinic. Um, it's great for corneal pain. It's an alternative to getting away from an opioid. And it has shown to get to the level um, of your of your opioids that are out there, morphine. Um, the issue is that just so everyone knows, it just doesn't stay up there as long. So it gets up there as high as the morphine um, level. It might be there. I don't know. I'll just make something up for, you know, for 20 minutes and then it starts to drop where maybe morphine goes for two or three hours. But I'm not poo-pooing it. Um, I use it all the time, two and two, four and two. Uh, in my practice, four ibuprofen, two Tylenol, or two ibuprofen, two Tylenol, um, and it's great for eye pain. Absolutely. Yep. No, nope. I think it makes it very, very straightforward. Um, yeah, you, know, you don't have to worry about getting through all your slides, and then if you want to wrap up towards the end there with your, you know, yeah. your Cochrane, that you know, you can kind of yeah. fast forward. So. Yep. Absolutely. I'll get moving. Um, this one we won't talk a lot about. I put that up there because um, I have had patients bring this in. I don't know if anyone else has seen this, but. Can see um, essentially is a cataract removal drop, and the lenosterol is a PET formulation. And so, if it's good for their canine, it must be good for them. But I bring this in there because the Cochrane, the evidence is just not quite there yet. There's really only two eligible studies that were reviewed. And when the authors were reached out to by the Cochrane researchers, they just didn't get good follow up. Don't know if there's more to the story on that one. But I think the difficult thing is here is if there is more evidence out there for N-acetylcarnosine, if there is the, physiologically um, and, and biochemically it, in vivo it, or in vitro rather, it makes sense. But how that chemical change in vivo, does it follow the same pathways? Is it going to work the same way? Um, I think that remains to be seen.
Um, so Nutriol, I think this is another one. So this is a, um, a lash lengthening. And so really what this is, is it's a medication that works in the antigen phase of lash growth. So as an alternative to Latisse, this is something, and I chose a very old presentation or a uh, clinical study because it's been known for a while. I think the Nutriol, because it's a topical, put it on your lashes, and it does show clinical improvement in about four weeks or so. I think there's a lot of value in considering this as an alternative to using one of the prostaglandin analogs with the side effects. So polling questions. I know we've only got about seven minutes left, so I'll go real quick after this one. You know what? Go ahead. Go through your slides. We don't have to worry about doing the polling question. Gotcha. So Central Cirrus, I'll just put this one up there. I think people know about this one. We published a case series in OVS on this one. And the reason that I want to bring that up is rifampin. So Central Cirrus choreoretinopathy, we're all familiar with the type A, we're all familiar with the high stress, but underlying all of that is your endogenous cortisol levels. And what the, uh, what the literature is starting to speak to is individuals that tend to have acute and chronic episodes of CSC tend to all share the elevated endogenous cortisol. So there's a high cortisol level just being pumped out through the adrenals. And so the case report I want to put in is one I had when I was on the Korean Peninsula, Christmas time. You guys can see there, you know what the condition is. So clearly, you know what you're going to see, but it's tough to tell on the picture. But looking at that right eye, you're not going to miss it here. Not the largest I've ever seen, but not too bad. So you can see that this guy just walked in off the street, a lot going on. So I'm like, well, geez, guy, he works on the flight line. So I need to get this figured out. You can see just how bolus this dome is, how large of an area, essentially, this uh, sensory retinal CSC detachment looks like. So Murphy's Law, both the ophthalmologists are off, can't get a hold of anyone. So I call Hawaii instead. And he's like, oh, I'm a retinal specialist. By the way, we use rifampin 300 milligrams BID for 30 days. If it doesn't work, then give me a call back 30 days later. So I'm not saying that it works every time and it will work this well for you. But for all of those that do see acute, especially acute, and even some of those chronic CSC cases, consider the rifampin pathway. Consider working with your PCM because um, I think that I've used this as a mainstay, even at the university with the ophthalmology group to prescribe the rifampin. But developing that relationship, I think that this is a nice off-label medication use because you're treating the root cause of the elevated uh, serum cortisol. So we're wrapping up right now. So you can can see we talked about it when off-label becomes on-label. So we're looking at Vuity, you're looking at Lumify, you're looking at Upneak, so another uh, alternative to apiclonidine. You're looking at Latisse, so a prostaglandin analog, and you're looking at Tirvaya. This one um, I think is an interesting synergistic and adjunctive treatment for dry eye disease because we're really working on the parasympathetic stimulation. So what you're doing is you're getting the glands that release the basal, the glands of Wolfram and Krauss that release the basal tear within the eye and you're stimulating them to release a little more. So I think there's value here because it's intranasal. So it's a different delivery route and it's an entirely different pharmacodynamic pathway. So you're not treating inflammation. You're not treating essentially evaporative conditions. You're treating stimulus of the parasympathetic release. So I think that Tirvaya is another alternative out there. Um, about four minutes left. I don't want to eat anything up. So I'll skip past this polling question if I can. Mm -hmm. sure. of course, so here are some of my adjunctive. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. Oh, go right ahead. Go ahead. Oh, gotcha. Um, so yeah, so here I've summed it all up. Um, what we're really looking at is if you want to go through these, the next five slides, everything we talked about here, the medication, the dosage, the route, and the duration. So really, you can see, I think, in a nutshell, that off-label medication use is absolutely primary care optometry's domain. I think there's quite a bit of trade space out there where we are been using a number of medications off-label for a number of years, but just better understanding what that drug class can do what that drug class can't do, but where you can work with either other providers or you work with the patient in the supplementary range, I think there's a lot of lot of value in what we can offer that patient on the uh, on the off-label medication side. 
And so if you keep going down here, these are all of the meta analyses. So I put the findings through those and you can see all the way through. These are all your slides. You can reach out to me directly. I'll have my email here in a moment. The so limitations and opportunity, nothing has nothing is out without limitation. So a lot of times, as we mentioned earlier, you may practice outside an integrated healthcare. Off-label medication may not be the standard of care, and an adverse reaction to an off-label can open you to liability. There is no doubt about that. But I think the opportunity comes that you can give meaningful treatment between the referral and the specialist follow-up. So if you have individuals that have significant swelling, significant inflammation, I think that there's something that you can add to reduce the inflammation, the exudation, give them something, just a nudge, if you will, to use a Malcolm Gladwell coined term, nudge them in the right direction. Excuse me, that's Thaler. I quoted it wrong. It was, no, he's going to be angry with me. Thaler is the nudge. Nudge them in the right direction. And I think the PCM teaming embraces integrated medicine. So as mentioned, here's the Cochrane database. There is the link to it. It has all specialties, optometry, ophthalmology, neurology, cardiology, but you go in there and it will give you the summarized, complete evidence-based randomized controlled trials that are put together in one large meta-analysis. I think there's a lot of value in using Cochrane to kind of get comfortable with what the evidence says you should be treating your patients with. I also recommend Hippocrates. On the left is your smartphone version and on the right is your laptop version. Have both, it's a free sign up. Um, there is a paid subscription that gives you a few more features, but the number one thing is that drug interaction check. And the Hippocrates value is the drug interaction includes supplementation. So when you're asking that review of systems, when you're doing that med reconciliation, make sure you're asking the patient about supplements, especially if you're gonna recommend a supplement to ensure that you're not creating an unintended interaction because you didn't know their full armament of, of supplements. So um, I mentioned the wisdom of crowds to start it out. So I think it's a good place to start to wrap this up. You can't dream of a face you've never seen. So a lot of what we know, a lot of how we practice, a lot of how we live our lives is really just an accumulation of small lessons along the way. So I think that kind of opening our minds a little bit and looking at what the opportunity is on that uh, off-label medication side. What can you consider to give benefit to the patient with minimal risk to give them a meaningful improvement in their visual performance, in their ophthalmic health? I think that's where the wisdom of crowds, everyone here on this call has different, uh, different backgrounds, but I think that's where we can all be better together. And with that, um, if there's any additional questions, you can reach out to me directly. I'm in clinic virtually all the time, every day. So send me an email. I will get back to you directly within 24 hours. So with that, thank you everyone for your attention today. And I had a, a great time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Go ahead and stop sharing your slides, Chris, so I can share sure mine. Can. Perfect. And Chris, I want to say thank you. All the questions were answered along the way. I didn't see anything new pop up. Joe, my chat box disappeared, so I'm not sure if there's anything in there. But Chris, thank you very much. And looks like the questions are answered. And uh, this was uh, pharmacology potpourri, uh, topicals to orals and primary care optometry. Chris, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you. All good in the questions, Joe? All good in the question. He's just getting his virtual round of applause, and people are thanking you for a very good lecture. I do want to thank you also for a very good lecture. I think we all got something out of this. Probably uh, we got quite a bit out of it. And one of the great things about what Greg and I are doing on our live meetings and these webinars are probably over 200 at this point is yeah, we get a lot of education, so we certainly appreciate this. It, it, this helps us, and hopefully it's helping you all, the audience as well.